There are some interesting procurement negotiations and a really fascinating dispute involving your neighbors to the north. Um, so I, I will spend some time talking about Ontario's fit. So I'm not going to go through these rules, but I will say the procurement trade rules are about an even playing field. Thou shalt not discriminate against suppliers from other countries, vendors, or against products from other countries. Um, this could be discrimination uh, actually in the words of the text, or it could be discrimination in effect. And um, the point about performance-based standards is that it is common to find at the state and local level procurement that not only buys the goods that you're looking for or the construction services you're looking for or uh, things of that nature, but rather um, using procurement to get an additional benefit or two. So can we buy our paper and stimulate a market for green goods, recycled paper? Um, can we buy our light bulbs and stimulate an economy of scale for light bulbs that last five times longer? That kind of thing. Um, can we buy our goods and assure that we're not simply feeding a sweatshop industry that is forcing kids into labor and they never get a chance to finish school? So you get the impression that Maine has at the state or local level has some version of those laws like all the other states do. I won't say all, but for each of those there are somewhere between five and 45 states that have those kinds of laws. So that's, that's the issue. And the global procurement rules want you to focus on performance of the product, not the extraneous considerations about how green the product is or whether human rights were violated in producing the product or something of that nature. So these are the negotiations that are going on. There's a lot happening. It's a very active field. Um, certainly there will be a TPPA procurement chapter. We don't know what it says because it hasn't been released. In fact, all the chapters are supposed to be secret. Just a few have been leaked, which enables me to talk to you about them. Not procurement. There is increasingly heated talk about a trade agreement between the United States and Europe. No doubt, Europe sees what's going on in the TPPA and they say, we want some of that action. We want a US-EU. They just negotiated a big trade agreement with Canada. If they can bring the United States into that orbit, then they get a piece of the US market action. And the United States knows that, so this all, all this TPPA may be a chess move in one direction to bring Europe in from the other. Procurement is part of it. This stuff is not as secret to them Yes, when you write your proposal, it's not a secret to you. <laughs> it's government to government. Yes, right. and, and my question is that the people that have the most to lose, gain or lose financially, are not the government on either side. Correct. It's the manufacturers. Right. Uh, so the secrecy that you speak of doesn't make sense to me because people who are applying the pressure are the, are the industry industries and therefore they must have inside access to a greater degree than uh, the public. I think that's fair. I also think in procurement there's a stronger government presence. Government has its own money at stake in procurement so as far as efficiency is concerned and openness or transparency of the process or efforts to minimize potential for corruption or favoritism. Um, I think there's a stronger incentive for government to be vigilant in this context than, say, in some other areas where government is simply the referee between big industries that are slugging it out on a global scale. This is what we were looking at earlier. Yeah. Um, I have on the screen the cover page of the intellectual property rights chapter. And apparently this is standard language on all the chapters. document is classified as of a certain date and it's to be declassified four years from entry into force. Why four years? Is that the standard election cycle? Mm -hmm. Accountability. So that was a 
important detour from the point we were making about procurement. The transitional point on the, any agreement involving the European Union is that they have their eyes set on state procurement. That's the area they want to expand the market. Two-thirds of the procurement in the United States is state and local, not federal. So they, they've seen the trend in terms of coverage of states under procurement agreements. In fact, one of the most pro-democratic, pro-democracy, I should say, um, trends in trade negotiations is where the U.S. government asks states whether or not they want to participate in the next procurement agreement. Starting with the WTO agreement, USTR asked governors, and 37 of them said yes. So all those states were listed. In about 2009, Maryland, joined by Maine and four other states, passed legislation saying that the governor shouldn't make this decision alone, it should be the state legislature participating. And a result of all this openness and democracy about procurement agreements and states deciding whether they want to subject themselves to these rules is that the number has gone down from 37 in the initial WTO agreement to 19 at the time of CAFTA, which was 2004, to the most recent agreement that they've actually shown us the list, Peru, two years ago, was down to eight. So the European Union is watching this and saying, if you want an agreement with us on procurement, you've got to bring the states in. Why is it going down? Because some states want to preserve their options for using procurement to do two or three additional things besides buy stuff. And if they use procurement to make the economy greener or to achieve economies of, economies of scale in terms of, uh, say, solar technology or to um, create a stronger market that honors human rights and make sure that workers are treated decently in the production of goods, things like that. Um, your, your options to do that are limited if you've got a whole set of global trade rules that say you can only discriminate between products based on how they perform. Oh, okay. Will the paper hold the ink? Don't ask me how the paper affects the river where the dioxin was let when they leached, when they bleached the paper. I just want to know whether it holds the ink or not. Especially if it's a Canadian river, don't tell me that you're going to not buy my paper because I polluted a river in Canada. That's not your business. There's more compliance. Yeah, exactly. But from the trade negotiator's perspective, when the states start bowing out of the <coughs> agreement, that may be good for openness and democracy, but it reduces their bargaining power. Now they have less leverage on the other countries. Now here's a big deal. There are eight countries knocking on the door. They want to be part of this procurement agreement in the WTO. One of them is China. China started trying to get into this agreement in 2007, and I, I don't believe they're close from what I've read um, for a number of reasons, including the fact that China has a lot of work to do to change its internal procurement laws so that they're comparable to ours. And <clears throat> China apparently is unwilling to commit enough of its agencies and provinces to make the deal worthwhile they have the same politics that the United States does. Chinese provinces aren't any more happy to be part of this agreement than you might be. Um, nonetheless, if China ever comes in, it raises really interesting oversight questions about what the impact on you would be, positive or negative. And is anybody talking to you about that? See, it's one thing to have a procurement agreement when all the other countries are either little and thereby posing no market threat to the way procurement is done, or countries like Canada that are very similar in governing the way they govern procurement with the similar values and you know, not a likely threat of litigation. If China comes in with its huge export potential and its willingness to uh, break the furniture to get what it wants, um, it raises interesting questions. It's a country that would be willing to use its rights to challenge measures if they thought they were being kept out of a market, even on a de facto basis. They're also aggressively moving into environmental goods where the United States, or at least some politicians in the United States, say they would like to create a sustainable economy, the so-called green jobs. Uh, there are negotiations in the General Agreement on Trade and Services. So 
services are covered by procurement under the procurement agreement, but they're also potentially covered under the services agreement. And they are, they've, for years they've been negotiating rules on, sir, on procurement of services. Those negotiations are not moving quickly. The protagonist in those negotiations is the, is the European Union, which wants much broader coverage. Through procurement or rules, procurement rules that apply to all governments at all levels. That's what the EU wants out of GATS. And it would not cover goods, it would just cover services, but big ticket items for state and local government. Water treatment, potentially electricity, um, hazardous waste management, solid waste management, transportation services, lots of things like that. Potentially health services, hospital services. <clears throat> And there's a new WTO procurement agreement. It was finished a couple months ago. Uh, have you heard of it? Uh, it's kind of big news, so um, it's my pleasure to bring it to your attention. So remember, 37 states are committed to the existing WTO procurement agreement. This was, that one was the revision of the old GATT procurement agreement dating back to the 50s. It was put a, had a WTO stamp put on it in 2004. And it's now up to um, 55 countries, I believe, who are participants. Um, and in the 1994 version, 37 states were committed to follow these procurement rules. It does include Maine. Uh, I think Maine, in the subsequent free trade agreements, Maine signed on to three, three yes and three no. However, um, the USTR has indirectly announced that it does not plan to submit this new procurement agreement to Congress. Um, I believe their reason why is because they don't think it requires changing any laws. And any time they can accept a trade agreement that doesn't require laws to be changed, it can be done as an executive agreement. It doesn't have to be submitted to Congress. So here's an oversight question for you. As a matter of law, how can you change a treaty that Congress once ratified by amending it like a wholesale, not, it's not a rewrite, but it's a wholesale scrubbing and cleaning and, you know, they fix the roof and they put on some new windows and there's a new back porch on it. It's a serious amendment. How can you do that without taking it back to Congress? It's a matter of law, constitutional review, or at least compliance with um, whatever trade negotiating authority is on the books at any moment. In case you're curious, here are, here's my list of some of the more interesting features. There's a lot of technical stuff in it, but it includes new processes for electronic commerce, bidding by computer, no, no human fingerprints, <coughs> electronic markets. Um, it requires companies to create a process for domestic challenges to procurements that do not comply with the WTO rules. So it's not a trade dispute. It's not like an investment dispute outside of government, the usual government process, but rather it says you must make a forum available inside your government for bidders to challenge your procurement process on grounds that it doesn't, it's not consistent with these WTO rules. So there's an oversight question for you. How would that work in the United States? And does, do you, does USTR believe that should require any change on your part? The last time I asked this question when they were working on this a few years ago was, no, it doesn't require any changes of the law on your part at the state level or by Congress or agencies at the national level. Their view is that the existing bidding complaint procedures for a disappointed bidder are sufficient. That's the kind of question you should ask your attorney general to answer for you, <laughs> rather than me. Um, Requirements that you award to the lowest bidder. How will that be interpreted and will it be different than the typical state requirement that you award contracts to the lowest responsible bidder or the lowest responsive bidder? Just a few word changes, but the U.S. standards at the state level may be a lot more flexible than this WTO standard. There are more limits on con contractor qualifications as well as technical specifications, mostly in the spirit of making sure you discriminate based only on performance of the product and not extraneous considerations like environmental impact. Um, here's an interesting one. 
you must provide notice to bidders as to why they were rejected. It's a transparency obligation. Maybe a good idea, but it also may be a lot of work. How does your chief procurement officer feel about that one? And then additional transparency obligations requiring you to publish on the internet the standard provisions of contracts that you use. How does your procurement office feel about that one? They may be doing it already or they may feel that that's part of the bargaining process they'd rather not have to show their hand. So take that in. Uh, the general question is should they be able to avoid Congress on amendments that are as substantive as these? Here's the dispute. Ontario in 2009, I think it was, adopted what's called a feed-in tariff. I'll call it the FIT. It favors electricity produced with wind and solar technology made in Ontario. So it's done through the procurement process, long-term contracts. It pays above market rates. Why? Because this technology is more expensive than buying electricity made out of a hydro project. And it, another benefit is that it's long term. <clears throat> Canada did not commit any province under the government procurement agreement. So I'm thinking that Canada assumed that it, it stayed out, it, it had kept clear of any entanglements with WTO procurement rules so that provinces could do exactly this kind of thing. So here's what happened. The European Union and Japan have brought a WTO claim, which is now being argued. Briefs are flying back and forth. They argue that the FIT violates the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, because it discriminates. And there's no doubt that it does. It's designed to discriminate in favor of Ontario-produced technology and the subsidy agreement, um, which similarly is a WTO agreement that prohibits subsidies that explicitly discriminate in favor of domestic content. It's actually a Japanese company that won the contract under the Ontario legislation. And they promised to build the factory in Ontario rather than using their existing factory in Tokyo. So if, this, if the EU and Japan win this case, I don't know what Ontario does with this contract. The company's already built the factory. It's going to be a really interesting, huge mess. It, I assume they'll negotiate something. But. <clears throat> so the, my point is this complaint is being brought under the agreement on goods is a discrimination, kind of discrimination, and the subsidies agreement, not the government procurement agreement. So the oversight question is, is the feed-in tariff, because it's procurement, truly covered by the GATT or not? That's your question. You may be interested in it if there are any main programs that you've tried to safeguard by keeping them outside of the orbit of the agencies that you listed um, in your schedules of compliance under the uh, procurement agreement. So here's the language. The GATT Article 3, Section 8 excludes procurement when it's for government purposes and not with a view to resale. So the EU argues that a feed-in tariff for electricity is not for government purposes. Ontario may be purchasing the electricity, but they're turning right around and selling it to their customers. It's an old-fashioned utility. Is that government procurement or not? Pretty fundamental question. And they also argue that Purchasing electricity might be a government purpose, but doing it in a way that creates Ontario jobs is not. That secondary purpose is illegitimate, argues the European Union. 
And the United States has also filed a brief. Here's an oversight question for you. What did you mean when you filed the brief? It criticizes Canada's arguments and implicitly takes sides with the European Union without actually saying so. So USTR, what's big picture, what's the purpose of your brief? Do you agree with the European Union that procurement is covered by the WTO agreement on goods? Why is that an important question? It's an important question because most states worked under the assumption that if they did not list an agency as covered under the procurement agreement, or that if they did not agree to participate at all, they were creating a safe harbor if they wanted to discriminate in favor of domestic suppliers like Ontario has, or if they wanted to use environmental preferences, or if they wanted to use human rights standards in the way that they did their procurement. What this case means is that that might all be for naught, particularly if you are interested in a state or local government in covering, um, in using preferences to stimulate your local economy, to do procurement and job creation. And especially interesting is the fact that while states have been deciding whether they want to be in these agreements or not, consistently throughout all of these procurement agreements, the United States has never listed city or county governments. Some countries have. If procurement preferences are indeed covered by the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, all governments at all levels are covered. So this interpretation by the European Union is pretty fundamental. It raises basic questions about what procurement is and who's covered by it. And it could completely upset all the expectations by state and local officials as to whether their procurement preferences are covered by trade rules or not. Does that make sense? So let me summarize. <clears throat> Regarding the GPA revisions, the change in the WTO agreement, the first question is, how does USTR justify not submitting the amendment to Congress? And by the way, I think maybe one reason they're not wanting to is because if they do submit it to Congress, it might create pressure for them to submit it to you also. How can they submit a major trade agreement for congressional ratification and not come back to you and say, by the way, we changed this agreement. Do you still want to be part of it? That may be the tail that wags the dog, actually. Because now they have 37 states. They're in a good bargaining position. If by submitting it to Congress, all the states wake up and say, whoop, we changed our mind, and that drops down to nine or eight, their bargaining position is undermined. So that could be, well, what's, a, what's afoot here? <clears throat> Another interesting question is how these provisions in the new GPA will work in the United States and whether it's true that they do not require you to change your appeals process for a disappointed bidder if that bidder wants to claim that you're not following WTO rules. And um, those are the questions. Regarding the EU interpretation of what procurement is and who's covered, I think we've pretty well gone over that. These are the oversight questions. <clears throat> And the final two questions, China in the WTO procurement agreement, that's a big deal. How's that going to affect the market? And how's that going to affect the risk of trade conflict? And what's up with the TPPA? What are you going to propose? Are you going to ask us whether we want to participate? And why all the secrecy? been very patient. You've now been subjected to more legal information than is found to be safe for human consumption. <laughs>